I wonder whether you recognize any of these people. What do you think they had have or had in common? Well, when I put this slide to the medical student, they don't know any of them. And my department has kindly suggested to me that perhaps it's a reflection of the increasing age gap between me and the students, and I should update the pictures. But, well, I hope you do recognize at least one of them. Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher is there. Peter Falk from my favorite detective series, Calam Calambo. Nusrat Bhutto, wife of Ali Bhutto. Charlton Heston, another actor. And our own Gamini Korea, who was a secretary general of UNCTAD, <laughs> brilliant man. They all had one thing in common, they all died of Alzheimer's dementia, which I'm going to talk about now. So it is no respect of intellect or persons. I'm going to talk on dementia, but when I say dementia, it would be mainly on Alzheimer's, but dementia is not only Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is the main cause, of course. Going back in history, uh, Alois Alzheimer, more than 100 years ago, admitted this lady called Auguste Dina to the Frankfurt Mental Hospital. She had severe memory loss and deteriorated very, very quickly within four years and died. And then Alzheimer, who was also a psychiatrist, neurologist, and a neuropathologist, all rolled into one. We don't get that combination nowadays since the PGM does not allow that kind of activity. I don't know why, but anyway, those are the days when you could do what you liked. So he very diligently followed this lady up. In fact, refused to transfer her from the hospital until she died, and then examined her brain, and found for the first time, demonstrated these two unique features of Alzheimer's, the, what we call the plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles. The plaques are the beta amyloid proteins, which are found outside the cells, and the neurofibrillary tangles are intracellular. Those are the, what we call the top proteins, which are found inside. The exact Significance is yet not worked out, but we presume that these collections are toxic to the brain and uh, damage the nerve cells. But the exact mechanisms are still not quite clear, even after 100 years. But these are the hallmarks of dementia. Well, why are we talking about dementia today? This audience is not in that category, or you think so? Well, it's a going emerging problem, and in 2050, we would have, they say, 135 million people with dementia. It's a reflection of aging, and you will find here that the main impact would be on the low- and middle-income countries, since our population is aging relatively, and it would hit Sri Lanka rather hard, because though we are not very rich, our lifespan is quite high compared to other neighboring countries, and it's about, I think, 75 now, and increasing. And so we are going to end up with a lot of people with the problem, since statistically, if I was 65, you have a 5 to 7% chance, and that's for the retiring professors to think about. And if you're in your 80s, it's about 20%. So statistically, without doing anything, uh, so therefore, who knows, you might be in that unlucky percentage. Now, as I said, Alzheimer's is not the only cause. We have uh, other causes, many other causes, but for the clinician, you have to worry only about three or four. That's it. You'll never see the other causes in your lifetime. Alzheimer's accounts for 70% of the dementias, and vascular, well, about 17%. And the other dementias, another 13%. So statistically, even if you don't do any other investigations, you can guess and say it's Alzheimer's, and you would be right most of the time. However, that's not how we practice medicine. Uh, we do some investigations to pin it down. But OK, let's see how is that important. So in addition to Alzheimer's, we, or with Alzheimer's, we have to we identified four clinical syndromes for a clinician, which would uh, be 90% of the cases you would see. So of course, on top, we have Alzheimer's, the classic dementia presenting with uh, severe memory loss, short-term memory loss. 
And then, of course, the vascular dementia, which are becoming important because people with high cardiovascular risk have uh, micro blockages in the brain. And that leads to a type of Alzheimer's called vascular dementia. Of course, the, there's overlap, so people can have both. And that would present with a lot of uh, cardiovascular symptoms, such as uh, TIAs. And we have a kind of a classic stepwise progression where with each insult, the, there's a sharp deterioration of the cognitive functions. The third type you may not have heard about, but it's a very fairly common one. It's called Levy body dementia. And that's associated with Parkinson's like uh, symptoms. And they're very sensitive to antipsychotics. And uh, that's the importance of that. It is not Parkinson's dementia. There's another dementia which comes with the Parkinson's disease, that pa dementia of Parkinson's disease. Don't confuse that with Levy body dementia. Here, the Parkinson's symptoms come afterwards, and the dementia symptoms come first. In Parkinson's dementia, the Parkinson's symptoms come first, and then the dementia symptoms. And the management and the prognosis is slightly different. Mm -hmm. And last of all, you get a condition called frontotemporal dementia, which presents with behavioral problems. And that can be very, very distressing for the family, because very calm and kind of sensible be people start, start behaving rather in an erratic manner. Of course, you might say that it's not necessarily a sign of frontotemporal dementia. We see that happening all the time, especially in our political field. But however, this is a medical problem. And very soon, of course, they will manifest the neurological symptoms. When I say soon, maybe up two, three years. So I've had patients who have been very, very contained gentlemen who suddenly started looking at the neighbor's wife kind of thing and started you know, giving gifts. In fact, one of my patients recently was referred by one of my medical colleagues when the very nice gentleman next door started giving rather expensive gifts to his wife. <laughs> and he was dead right. He did have frontotemporal dementia, so I'm treating him now. Uh, so anyway, this is how this goes. <laughs> uh, right. So number one is Alzheimer's, of course. What are the risk factors for dementia? The risk factor, main in fact, the main factor, of course, is age. And there's nothing we can do about that. We all age. Then, of course, the vascular factor, which we can do something about. And that's where the physicians will come in. And important head trauma, which we don't think about now. Of course, you might say, well, hang on, we don't have that many accidents? Well, we do. There are 12,000 people now with uh, neurological deficits after road traffic accidents in Sri Lanka, right at the moment. That's what Dr. Sunipera tells me. And uh, even if you don't have an obvious accident, even a close brain, what called traumatic brain injury due to contact sports can put you at risk of dementia. And that's something we have to pay attention to now, especially with uh, children going into contact sports, not necessarily boxing. Even hockey is considered a contact sports, OK? And uh, that puts you at high risk of dementia. So in fact, a neurologist was asked whether he would put his children into these sports. Say, no, definitely not. He would not allow any of them to play either rugby, definitely not boxing, hockey, or any of the what we call the contact sports. Well, I'm not suggesting to pull out your <laughs> relatives from these sports, but anyway, something to think about. Especially if they have concussion, you have to be very careful. You don't send them back into the field immediately. It used to be a badge of honor in rugby that you have to get concussed. Otherwise, you are not a, well, a good player. That is no longer something to laugh about. <laughs> right, anyway. So family history is important. There's a very small percentage who get dementia due to genetic uh, defects. And of course, depression puts you at risk. We don't know why, but it does. So as you grow older, three things happen. The first is your memory goes, and then you, you can't remember the other two. Happens all to me all the time. I start putting a list of reasons, and then, OK, number one is this number. Well, two, three, well, go and read up. <laughs> well, I have forgotten. Unless it's, of course, on the slide, which <laughs> acts as a prompt. Right, so the, these are the important genes. Uh, yeah, the one 
the first two are important in early dementia, and that is not a common thing. But however, number three is apolipoprotein E4. And if you have that gene, you are about 30% more likely to get dementia. So there's some value in identifying whether you have it or not. In fact, uh, 25 to 30 percent of the population have the ApoE4. If you have the ApoE2, you are protected. If you have ApoE3, which is the common one, uh, it's neutral. Okay. So ApoE4 can be identified, and then we can test ourselves and see whether we are at 30 percent higher risk. Can we do anything about it? Well, yes and no. So let me answer that question later. Right. So when you look at dementia, how does it work out? You have the preclinical dementia. Dementia, Alzheimer's, the early signs developed 20 years or 30 years before. So in fact, all of us here who are going to get Alzheimer's, and I'm afraid some are going to get, already have the changes, OK? And if we can do a PET amyloid scan, we can identify it. So $5,000, but anyway, it can be done. And then, of course, if you are going into dementia, you have an early sign called MCI, mi minimal cognitive impairment. And then, of course, later you go into dementia. So that's how this progresses. In MCI, there is memory loss, but there are no functional impairments. You function OK, but you feel that you know, you're not remembering things as you used to, which, of course, can be worrying and, in, ha in fact, happens to us, all of us. So, and I'm also thinking that I, I'm not as sharp as in the days of old when I could remember all these names, especially when I'm teaching the postgraduates, I get a bit pushed. But of course, the Google comes to my salvation. I don't look it up, I tell them, you look it up, and tell me, and pretend that I know the answer, but then that's how these things go anyway. So they tell me, ah, yes, it's there. So I say, yeah, that's right. So why don't you study these things? Right, how do you diagnose? Well, we have a Easy one is we use a rating scale. So in minimal cognitive impairment, you will have a MMSC is normal, functionally normal. It's only the clinical report. So don't ignore clinical reports. Take them seriously. I will not go into the differentiation of amnestic, non-amnestic types since they are a bit short of time. So let's go on to the diagnosis. It goes in three, four steps. First to suspect, and suspicion is always the report of the patient. When they say, I am having problems, or the relatives say, do not ignore it. Do please screen, and at least do the screening test, which you can do very easily. And if you are pushed for time, and you don't have the time as a clinician, you can always refer. For example, we have a clean screening unit in our department in Colombo, so if you make a telephone call, you can book an appointment, and the patient can get it done there. It costs 1,000 rupees, that's it. And they will come back with a report to you. So you can then just tell them, get the appointment, get it done, come back with the report. And that saves you one hour of time. And I know clinicians have no time to be doing these rating scales. We will do it for you. And that's not an not a expensive test to do. They are very specific, actually. And what we look for are these deficits in six domains of cognitive functions, complex attention, executive ability, learning and memory, language, perception, perceptual, and social cognition. So these six areas are what we look at in the rating scales. And if you find deficits at least in one, that's almost diagnostic according to the DSM-5. And these are the higher, higher functions, which the neurologists do not test for usually, and needs different tests. So your normal routine tests will come normal, especially if the person is a fairly high-functioning person, like a teacher, even with dementia, they will score full marks. Right. So what are the tools we use? These are the three tools we use in our department, the MMSC, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and the Neurocognitive Assessment. Very sensitive, the last one. Almost guaranteed to pick it up if you have even mild impairment. Some of your colleagues have braved it, but it's a bit threatening because you try to do it, and you get a bit ang anxious, and that can affect your assessment. I haven't undergone this test. In fact, number the one in the middle was what Donald Trump underwent, and he scored full marks on it. <laughs> and therefore said he does not have any problems, but other people said, well, that doesn't mean that you don't. But 
Right, anyway, investigations, uh, these are the biomarkers we can use, but can, we can't use it in Sri Lanka. If we analyze the CSF, you can identify these deficits, uh, not diagnostic, but can indicate a problem. So the, the TOR, the, these are the products that you find in the brain. So they get less in the CSF and more in the brain. So that's how it go, goes like. So low CSF amyloid beta 42, uh, high CSF TOR, it's reversed, and a reduced hippocampal volume, and a medial temporal atrophy. So these are the changes. The neuroemerging is helpful, but it can't exactly diagnose, but we mainly use it to differentiate Alzheimer's from vascular dementia. So the vascular dementia picture is different to Alzheimer's. So that's helpful in determining the where you should put your management emphasis. So that's the only reason we do that. Of course, the PET amyloid scan will be useful if you can do it. It's expensive, and that will show the distribution of amyloid, which starts many, many, many years earlier. However, the, even if you have it, doesn't mean you will get dementia. It's only 50% to progress. But if it's negative, then you can be more or less sure that you will, will, you will not get dementia. So it's of negative predictive value, right? But maybe that might also comfort you, but again, it's not available. Okay, treatment. What can we do? We can treat symptomatically the memory disturbances. You can treat the behaviors arising out of the damage. We cannot modify the disease at the moment, so the last thing is not possible. And these are the medicines that are available in the world today. There are, uh, well, uh, well, basically four really. Donopacil, rivastigmine, galantamine, memantine. The first three are anticholinesterase inhibitors. Galantamine is not available in Sri Lanka, but we have donopacil and rivastigmine in the private sector. Unfortunately, not yet in the government hospital, but we will get it next year. Memantine is an NMD antagonist, which is the latest one, and that's all we have. And the FDA, of course, in their guidance, would say you start with a cholinesterase inhibitor first, and then add on the memantine later, when the dementia becomes more severe. However, in Sri Lanka, I tend to do it the other way. You start, I start with the memantine and add the donopazil if necessary later, because memantine is actually better and uh, also has very much less side effects, hardly ever, and the dosing is very simple. You start with five milligrams and go to 20, increasing by five milligrams every two weeks, and 20 is the optimum, that's it. So go from five to 20, keep it at 20 till the patient lives, that's it. Uh, that's the only thing principally to follow. Side effects are very rare. And don't stop halfway. Don't give half dose of MMT. Problem with the cost, of course, but they're not very expensive because we get our medicines from India. They are not the innovator. They are the clones. And, for example, in the States, it will cost to $20,000 a month. Here, a tablet is about 50 rupees. So 50 rupees into, you can calculate the cost per month is about 2,000, 3,000 rupees for MMT. So we don't have to follow the FDA guidelines. We can give the expensive one, which is not expensive in Sri Lanka. So paradoxically, we can give the best treatment compared to the states. Right. And of course, manage the expectations of the patients. There are, of course, always behavioral problems which come about, unfortunately. And these are very difficult to manage because they get very restless, agitated. And uh, not much we can do other than having a good care. And if really pushed, we will give small doses of antipsychotics, not heavy ones, because they are very sensitive. And the one popular one that we use is quetiapine, which is uh, relatively gentle and works fine. Uh, then, of course, the last question which I said, can you do anything about it if, let's say, you find you have the apoprotein gene, or you think your relatives have had dementia, and you are wondering, can I do anything? Well, yes and no. There are well, basically, I'll cut it short and say there are three things you can do to reduce your risk. Three things that are proven by science. Okay. So, number one, Alzheimer's Association, of course, has ten things you can do, but they are not proven. So, the three proven things, number one is exercise. You exercise, aerobic exercise, more than three hours a week. And now they have worked out that if you exercise 55 hours in six months, that puts your risk down by about 30, 40%. So that's not the small thing. Right, so three hours means half an hour, five days a week. 
how many of us are doing that right now? <laughs> and that will reduce the risk of so many other diseases for you <laughs> in one, one go. Uh, sleep well, very important to sleep. Eight hours minimum, we don't do that. And eat well, that means don't eat too many carbohydrates, <laughs> cut down the fats, <laughs> and eat sensibly. If you do those three things only starting today, you will cut your risk of Alzheimer's by 30%. 30%. Though untreatable, it's preventable in that sense. So that's the paradox of Alzheimer's. Right, there is it. Right. In fact, they tried this program in uh, 10 selected people, this uh, fa fairly famous paper. 10 selected people, they put in everything we know about how to prevent Alzheimer's, including the non not so proven ones, including turmeric, uh, olive oil, fasting for 12 hours, all the vitamins possible. And in 10 people, nine people reversed their dementia. But the study has not been replicated. And Dr. Dale Bredesen, Bredesen of course, being an American, has now, well, he is selling the program. You can buy it on the internet. Right, do Okay, I'll skip that. The finger study, the most famous one, uh, about diet and Alzheimer's, okay. So that's the one where they show that if you kind of uh, take care of your diet, exercise, you can save your brain. Well, there's documented proof about that. Right, so that's about what I want to say today, since the time is short, but it's a, a very interesting and important topic and relevant for you also, because I know some doctors are having big problems with their aging parents, especially when they go abroad and don't come back, well, and we had to look after them. And right, okay, so just to finish, as Alois Alzheimer died at 51, soon after being appointed professor of psychiatry, which is a well, respect, I suppose. Well, what happened? He was on the train to Berlin to take up the appointment. He got an infection, a sore throat. And he got a rheumatic heart failure and died. And there were no antibiotics those days to treat. So he died at the same age as his patient, who died of dementia. Well, we can treat Alzheimer's problem, but we can't treat the patient's problem yet. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening.